I should probably begin with an apology. This episode is by far the most audacious one for me so far, at least in terms of scope. Over the next hour, I'm going to traverse 50 years and four countries, and many of the characters have interweaving plots and complicated interests in marriages. But through my podcaster's distillation process, I was forced to skim over and in some cases totally remove elements that, though important in their own right, didn't really fit into the narrative. So for what is not included in this podcast, I apologize. But nonetheless, what you're going to hear is a story that, to bookend properly, needs to be told on a large scale because the relationship of the of the countries involved, Wales, France, Scotland, England, they look one way at the beginning of this story and another way at the end of the story. In fact, the very concept of power wielded by the King of England changes dramatically in the course of this 50-year drama. It's a story that I think gives Game of Thrones a run for its money, not only because it's a true story, but because it's got everything that a good drama needs. War, kings, queens, knights castles, murder, vengeance, forbidden love, conquest, torture, rebellion. It's the total package. And there's one main character who will sort of be our guide on this tale. He's actually an ancestor of my wife's. His name is Guy Beauchamp, though he receives the nickname the Black Dog of Arden. We know a good deal of technical information about Guy, such as he was here in this place in this year and he did this thing but there's not a lot of intimate knowledge. However, if you follow his life's timeline, we get to be witness to this historical drama that he was involved in. Maybe the greatest drama to ever unfold in the English monarchy. And by the end of his life, he suddenly inserts himself into the tale as a vigilante hero of the nobility, you might say. And he does something that can be viewed as a catalyst for the entire turning point in the history of all the countries that are now the United Kingdom. The famous movie Braveheart depicts a few of these events that I'll be detailing, but while Braveheart is an awesome movie, it gets almost all of its characters wrong. As many of us history aficionados already know, history is usually never as simple as good guys versus bad guys. It's just full of people and their faults. Personally, I love the grit of the real stories. Give me the real person with all their faults and all their nuance. And so without further delay from me, We'll go back to right around the end of the 13th century, near the close of a conflict between Wales and England, and look at some of the historical events that you think you might be familiar with. And our guide will be the Black Dog of Arden. King Edward stood atop the parapet walls of Conway Castle. The smoldering remains of the town of Conway still reeked heavy in the cold winter air. The Welsh had chased the king all the way to this place, castle by castle. His army barely outran them before making it behind the safety of the stone walls, just before Christmas, two months ago. When the Welsh failed to breach Conway Castle, they burned the town surrounding it and dug in for a siege. How had it come to this, the king must have thought. He had conquered this backwater nation twice. He had killed their prince, or more specifically, I should say. He had the Welsh leader dragged through the streets, hung up and disemboweled. His entrails were burned before him while he was still alive. And then his body was cut into four pieces, each sent to the four corners of Wales to remind the people of their insolence, otherwise known as being drawn and quartered. As the new overlord of Wales, Edward erected a number of fortresses strategically placed throughout the new territory, just in case they ever entertained any silly notion of rebellion. He had, in fact, built the very castle in which he was now held up, an English castle on Welsh soil. And now this rebel scum, led by a Welshman, claiming inheritance to the throne of a bereft house, 
had outwitted and outfought the vastly superior English fighting force. Inside Conway Castle, all of King Edward's strength in numbers and arms counted for nothing. The Welsh had broken his supply line, and now low on food, the king's men were preparing to starve to death. The mastermind of this destructive rebellion was a guy named Madog Ap Lywelyn. He claimed to be the rightful heir to the throne of Wales, and he wanted the yoke of the English king and his heavy taxes off the Welsh people. They wanted to be Welsh, not English. And so on the Feast of St. Michael the Archangel, Madog launched his coordinated revolt and started sacking English strongholds in his country. When the rebellion broke out, King Edward was gearing up to cross the English Channel for a fight with the French, but he reluctantly put the invasion of France on hold to deal with the pesky Welsh yet again. And now, just a few short months later, in the depths of winter, it looked as though his army may disintegrate through hunger. Edward personally faced certain capture, and he would either be held as a hostage for ransom or simply beheaded as a tyrant. His decapitated head, impaled on a pike, would no doubt adorn a place of prominence for Madog. After all, it's not every day you get to kill the King of England. But as February turned to March, incredible news reached King Edward. The Earl of Warwick had found Madog's main army 80 miles to the south and was engaging it. The Earl of Warwick, a man named William Beauchamp, was camped at a town named Welshpool, when his scouts became aware of the bulk of the Welsh fighting force led personally by Madog camping for the night just eight miles to the west. The Earl of Warwick recognized fate when he saw it, and he did not hesitate. He ordered his men to break camp immediately. That night, Beauchamp's army quietly surrounded the Welsh and at once charged from all sides with English cavalry, otherwise known as knights, armored men on armored horses, the 13th century equivalent of a tank. Now, enemies of the English had learned to fear their cavalry charges like the wrath of God. But they had also learned their weaknesses. That weakness was a formation called the Skiltron. and was a tight group of men huddled together with long wooden spears wedged into the ground. This formation had often, and very effectively, resisted the crushing force of metal-clad beasts. If the Skiltron worked correctly, the horses would refuse to charge and the enemy horses that didn't halt in time, they were skewered, and as the riders were flung to the ground in the chaos, the awaiting enemy would pummel and stab and crush the knights to death, leaving them like a bloody pulp inside of a tin can. But this was not Beauchamp's first rodeo. He'd fought the Welsh before, and he knew what they would do. As expected, the mass of men, led by Maddog, huddled together in a tight group and frantically propped the butts of their spears into the ground to repel an enemy cavalry charge descending upon them. That's when the Earl of Warwick called up his archers. They emerged from the shadow of the woods, calculated the distance to the large group of men, and let loose their arrows. And the quick but deadly rain of hell sent the Welsh scattering out of the protective wall of spears, while Beauchamp's armored knights pursued them, hacking and slashing as they went. The English cavalry drove the Welsh rebels into a nearby river, where they tried to swim across to safety, but weighed down by weapons and armor, and many probably couldn't swim anyway. Most of them drowned in their attempt to escape death by the English sword. William Beauchamp, the ninth Earl of Warwick, had obliterated the main army of the Welsh Rebellion in just a few short hours. And without military support, the siege of Conway Castle was broken, and King Edward's army was freed, rescued from the brink of disaster. The Welsh leader, Madog Ap Lywelyn, was captured as an outlaw six months later, and he was brought to London, where he lived as a prisoner for the rest of his life. William Beauchamp, the man who had saved King Edward, he previously inherited his earldom of Warwick from his uncle who died without an heir. And for quick reference, an earl on the English nobility scale is below a duke but above a baron. It basically means you get a big territory to govern as you wish. You collect taxes and fines and settle disputes in your realm. And most importantly, you get a castle to live in. And for the record, Warwick Castle is pretty impressive, at least as far as Norman castles go. If you're looking for like a Sleeping Beauty type of castle in the clouds, Google German castles. Norman castles tended to look like prisons with parapets, and they're not very dreamy. But regardless, as far as Norman castles go, Warwick Castle is one of the better ones. When William Beauchamp defeated the Welsh, he was 56 years old, and he had a 23-year-old son named Guy. Four years later, William died, and his son Guy inherited the title of 10th Earl of Warwick. Guy Beauchamp was given his name at birth with a nod towards English mythology. There was a legend from the Matter of England, which is like a compendium of English folklore tradition, most of which is Arthurian legend type of stuff. There was a legend about a hero named Guy of Warwick. 
and it's said that the hero, Guy of Warwick, in order to prove his love and valor to a beautiful woman, went on adventures slaying dragons and other mythical beasts. Until, in the end, he rejected his violent nature and he went on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and became a hermit. Now, Guy Beauchamp, upon his father's death, could rightly bear the same name as that mythical hero, Guy of Warwick. And on Easter Sunday, 1296, King Edward knighted the young Guy of Warwick, I'm sure hoping that he would prove to be as loyal to the crown as his father was, and if he could only look into the future and know how loyal Guy would actually be. Two years after being knighted, the 10th Earl of Warwick would have his first opportunity to prove his loyalty and his worth. There was another crisis brewing with England's next-door neighbors, but not the Welsh. This time it was the Scots. To understand what was happening in Scotland, I've got to backtrack by, I don't know, about a decade to bring us up to speed on the situation in England's neighbors to the north. This backstory is going to take a few minutes, but it's critical in understanding future events. It's also an unbelievably fascinating story, so bear with me. Back in 1286, the King of Scotland, King Alexander III, died without any direct heirs. And if you know a little bit about medieval history, you know that an empty throne produces chaotic sagas that are something like a cross between Game of Thrones and a Spanish soap opera. In the wake of Alexander's death, there were two main royal Scottish families that had the most substantial claims to be a successor, the House of Balio and the House of Bruce. And if you're not familiar with the way lines of monarchical succession go, unless there's a direct son or daughter, the rules tend to be very vague. Civil war between the claimants was always a very real possibility, but it seemed for the moment that cool heads would prevail. The competing houses agreed to allow the dead king's next of kin to inherit the throne. The next of kin was his three-year-old granddaughter, Margaret. Margaret was the daughter of Eric, the king of Norway, who Alexander's daughter had married. She unfortunately died in childbirth, leaving her daughter Margaret and her husband Eric behind. Eric of Norway was in favor of his daughter taking back her birthright, but he was also afraid for her life. Part of the deal was that she would need to travel back to Scotland with a group of Scottish nobles, dubbed the Guardians of Scotland, who would rule in her place until she had found a suitor to marry and, and he could then take the reins. Back in these days, it was typical if the line of succession was passed to a female heir, she would be betrothed and married to another royal who would be crowned king. But Eric's fears for his daughter's safety were very real. The three-year-old girl would have to travel by land and by sea and then survive another 10 years or so without falling victim to some unfortunate or untimely accident, which was so often the case around power vacuums. King Edward of England, not missing a beat, offered a solution for everybody. Using the power of the English throne, he would guarantee the safety of Eric's infant daughter in exchange for her betrothal to his five-year-old son, also named Edward. And King Edward would sweeten the pot for Eric even more. You see... When Alexander's daughter married Eric, there was a negotiated dowry that was never fully paid by the King of Scotland, and still currently outstanding. And so the benevolent monarch Edward would pay off Scotland's dowry debt as part of this deal. Of course, everybody knew that this would inherently pass Edward's son the crown of both England and Scotland upon his ascension. But the deal was too good to pass up. Scotland did not want a civil war, and they didn't have the money to pay Norway. And King Eric, who was only 22, by the way, he wanted his daughter to inherit her birthright without being murdered. He would also receive quite a financial boon. This agreement was called the Treaty of Burgum, and it was signed by the Guardians of Scotland in 1290. The treaty included some clauses about how, even though there would be one crown over both countries, Scotland would maintain its own boundaries and its own legal apparatuses. These clauses likely didn't worry Edward that much. He thought if that's what made Scotland happy, fine. In the end, he knew he would do whatever he wanted anyway. They were another backwater people, leaderless, and quite demonstrably dependent on his assistance in their affairs. So we'll take a minute to review the person that was King Edward of England. He bore the nickname Longshanks for his unusual height, Shanks referring to his legs. By age 20, as Prince of England, he joined a group of rebel barons against his own father, the king, and then a few years later, he fought for his father against another group of rebel barons, utterly crushing them. His reputation for both talent and brutality in war began at an early age. He was once held captive in an enemy castle, but he managed to escape. And by the time he was 32, he went on a crusade to the Holy Land. When he returned, his father was dead and he was crowned King Edward I of England. <laughs> 
As king, he reformed the antiquated legal systems. He went toe-to-toe with powerful barons, checking their powers and reestablishing the authority of the king that was lost under his father. When he was short on money, he took loans out from the Jewish community, and then he kicked them all out of England. He pummeled the pesky Welsh into submission. He built castles on their land. He relocated English citizens into Wales to make the bloodlines more English. And one of his favorite hobbies was invading France. He had utter command of every room that he occupied. He was iron-willed in determination, yet pragmatic in rule, and a highly skilled negotiator. The inexperienced King Eric of Norway and the desperate Scottish nobles were no match for Edward's ability to control events. And through this whole process of Scottish succession, he had shrewdly composed a legal paper trail, if you will, for his overlord status of the Northern Kingdom. And all everybody had to do was wait for Margaret to grow up and marry Edward's son. Scotland would have a king again, Eric's debts would be paid off, And Edward Longshanks would be remembered as the man who united Scotland and England under one crown through his son, Edward II. However, in written in blood history, I often say that history is a funny thing. And well, it is. As three-year-old Margaret set sail without her father to the shores of England where her safety would be guaranteed, she fell ill at sea. It's thought from food poisoning. This poor little girl, incapable of perceiving the gravity of her importance, was dead within a week. Her body was placed in a coffin and sent back to her grief-stricken father in Norway. Immediately following Margaret's death, the claimants to the Scottish throne again stepped forward, and again it was Balio and Bruce with the strongest cases. Scotland stood closer than ever on the precipice of civil war, and the guardians of Scotland, not knowing what to do, fled to Edward Longshanks for help. They asked him to step in and settle the dispute of lordship. Edward organized a council of 104 auditors that would all hear the cases of the claims of the Scottish crown and decide on whose was the most worthy. He named himself as president of this council, and during the whole process, he styled himself as overlord of Scotland, settling a dispute amongst petulant children. And some Scottish nobles even proclaimed him as such. On November 17, 1292, a verdict was reached, and John Balliol was proclaimed the rightful heir and given the throne of Scotland. A big part of Balliol's success was owed to the support of John Comyn II, who happened to be the most powerful baron in Scotland at the time. And remember Comyn's name. He comes up a little bit later. With the Scottish question settled, Longshanks could turn his attention to his real enemy, France. His land holdings in Gascony had been confiscated by the French king Philip IV, and he wanted them back. In order to provide for this war effort, Longshanks demanded support from Balio in the way of money and men. And at every turn, Scotland was treated like a vassal state, effectively stripping Balio of any actual autonomy of his own. Scotland, despite having a new king, was still under Edward's heavy thumb. In his eyes, he was, after all, their overlord. But after three years of outright bullying of John Balio by Longshanks, the Scottish nobles had had enough of this puppet of the English throne. And in 1295, a new Guardians of Scotland was formed. And while leaving Balio as their king, they essentially wrestled control of the government from him. The first thing they did was force Balio to sign a treaty with Philip IV of France that united both nations in their struggle against England. The terms weren't great for Scotland, but as usual, they were desperate. And so if Edward tried to invade France, Scotland would be required to invade England. This alliance came to be called the Old Alliance, and it would actually last five centuries. Shortly later, in a move that seems illogical at best, suicidal at worst, the Scots, on March 26, 1296, under John Comyn, invaded England and launched an unprovoked attack against Carlisle Castle. But they brought no siege weapons with them. And so instead of continuing against a castle that they had no means to take, the Scottish burnt the town of Carlisle. And in their retreat back to Scotland, they burnt more English towns, a few monasteries, and they tried to take another castle. And so King Edward's attempt at taking control of Scotland through pen, paper, and puppetry had now failed. Balio had apparently turned on him and signed a treaty with his sworn enemy, and now these Scots even dared to attack English territory. If the ineffectual Scottish invasion accomplished one thing, it was to draw the wrath of Longshanks. Two days after the Scottish attack on Carlisle, Edward sent an army to attack the Scottish town of Berwick. There was little resistance to the mighty English force, and once the town was breached, the result was a bloody massacre. Quote, When the town had been taken in this way and its citizens had submitted, Edward spared no one, whatever the age or sex. 
and for two days streams of blood flowed from the bodies of the slain. For in his tyrannous rage, he ordered 7,500 souls of both sexes to be massacred, so that mills could be turned by the flows of their blood. End quote. That's the account of the massacre of Berwick from Bowers' Scotochronicon. Edward kept his army at Berwick for a month where they could use it as a launch pad for their next target against the rebel Scots. Dunbar Castle lay just a few miles to the north. When the English reached Dunbar, an urgent message was sent to King John Balio for assistance. Balio sent the main body of the Scottish force to contend with the English, but he didn't go himself. It was John Coleman again leading the Scots, and the two armies met on April 27th. But the battle was a complete rout. The disorganized Scottish army quickly floundered under the discipline of the English, and most of the Scottish fled. Many were taken prisoner, including John Coleman. And the next day, King Edward personally arrived on the scene, whose presence alone was enough to terrify Dunbar Castle into a formal surrender. But Longshanks was far from done. He wanted his puppet. He wanted John Balio. The King of England took his army on a tour of Scotland where castle after castle surrendered, most without a fight. Haddington, Lauder, Roxborough, New Battle Abbey, they all surrendered. Edinburgh Castle attempted to resist Edward, but gave up only after five days. When Edward arrived at Stirling Castle, it was completely abandoned except for the butler, who gladly handed the keys over to the king. After that, more castles surrendered, more towns capitulated. The bloodbath that was at Berwick was an effective message. Surrender to the indomitable will of the King of England and live. And just a few short weeks later, John Balio, King of Scotland, also surrendered himself to Longshanks. In front of a crowd gathered for the occasion, he confessed to rebellion, he renounced his treaty with the French, and he begged for forgiveness. And finally, he was dressed in his royal vestments for all to see, and the Bishop of Durham literally tore the crest of Scotland from his coat. And forever after, John Balio was known as Tomb to Bard, the Empty Coat. He was sent to the Tower of London, and was eventually released to live in France and remain the rest of his life in obscurity. King Edward, after bringing Scotland to its knees, had one final task to complete his domination of the broken country. He removed the Stone of Destiny from Scone Abbey. It was a stone chair on which all the Scottish monarchs had been crowned, and he had it fashioned into a chair for himself at Westminster Abbey, where it's been used as a coronation chair for English monarchs ever since. You can almost hear Darth Vader's marching music in the background. And with Scotland subjugated and humiliated, Longshanks could now finally focus on his real enemy across the Channel. He and his army left for France, leaving his son Edward II, who was only 13 at the time, as regent in charge of the realm, a realm which now included Scotland. All may have gone well for the young prince in his father's absence had it not been for a certain man. And as I've said in previous episodes, sometimes there's a man. And history often likes to throw the right man at the wrong time at certain people. This man's name was William Wallace. Wallace's early life is relatively obscure. What's important is what he started doing after Longshanks left England for France. In May of 1297, William Wallace assassinated the English High Sheriff of Lanark, a Scottish town. He then linked up with another Scottish noble, and together they led an army to march on the Scottish town of Scone, which they quickly took control of and sent the English-appointed Justice of Scotland fleeing for his life. Inspired by Wallace's actions, uprisings began popping up all over Scotland, and the flame of rebellion had been ignited. As William Wallace kept piling up the Scottish victories, Prince Edward finally mustered a formal English army to put down the rebels. The two armies met at Stirling Bridge. Wallace had around 5,000 men, while the English probably had more than twice that number of professional soldiers. As the English crossed the bridge to engage, Wallace waited for the bulk of the enemy to make it to his side of the bridge, and then he attacked in advancing Skiltron-style formations. The English, who had already crossed, retreated from the moving wall of spears that was closing in on them, and they began crowding the bridge with the other soldiers behind them, and cluttered and smashed together on the narrow crossing like the hot gates of Thermopylae, the English numerical superiority counted for nothing. And as the Scottish mowed down the English soldiers at the front of the log jam, the weight of the men caused the bridge to give way and collapse, and 5,000 English soldiers were either killed or drowned as a result of this battle. King Edward's royal treasurer was killed in the chaos, 
It said that his body was flayed and his skin was cut into small pieces of victory tokens to be handed out, which is rather macabre. Wallace himself supposedly took a strip of the treasurer's skin from head to heel and fashioned it into a shoulder strap for his sword. After Stirling Bridge, William Wallace was knighted and proclaimed a guardian of Scotland. Then he began leading daring raids into England itself. Wallace's victories while King Edward was abroad was an abject disaster for the English, and it's likely that no Englishman felt it more acutely than young Prince Edward. In early 1298, Longshanks returned victorious from France. He had secured his land holdings across the channel by a force of arms and shrewd negotiations. He had agreed to take the King of France's sister for a wife, and he negotiated for his son's betrothal to the king's then two-year-old daughter, Isabella. And thus, a peace treaty was signed with England's oldest enemy, but the king's return to England was tarnished and dominated by the Scottish mess on his hands, a mess that, whether fair or not, lay at the feet of his son. In April of 1298, Longshanks mustered an army of around 25,000 men and invaded Scotland again. And now we can circle back and pick up with young Guy Beauchamp of Warwick. Guy's father had shown his loyalty and worth to the king, and the time had come for him to do the same as he marched with Longshanks against William Wallace. I know that was a long digression, but it was necessary to set up the dramatic events that are about to unfold. This situation is so incredibly tense, and emotions are running high among people with immense and unchecked power. So for us to understand these emotions, we had to understand the history here. King Edward forced Wallace into a pitched battle at Falkirk, and predictably the Scottish fell back into their Skiltron formations, those walls of spears that so effectively repulsed English armored cavalry charges. Edward threw some cavalry at their Skiltrons to test the resolve before unleashing a deadly weapon he had brought with him. In exchange for royal pardons, thousands of Welsh soldiers arrived armed with their infamous longbows, which had a firing rate of 14 arrows per minute. And in a move reminiscent of Guy Beauchamp's father's victory over the Welsh, the arrows decimated the Scottish soldiers behind their wall of spears. As the arrows fell upon the Scottish, English infantry had been persistently closing the gap of no man's land, waiting for the right time to strike. Once the Skiltrons fell, the infantry pressed forward and penetrated the Scottish lines, followed by the full weight of armored cavalry. The Scottish were completely routed, with nearly half of the force being killed or wounded. William Wallace, however, had escaped. Guy Beauchamp continued to march with Edward as he again mopped up the Scottish resistance, just as he did two years earlier. This invasion, although, turned into an outright occupation. With no leadership, no army, and really no hope left, the Scottish barons reached out with a desperate plea to the Pope himself to intervene on their behalf. And in 1301, the King of England received a letter from the Pope, condemning his treatment of the Scots and rejecting his claim of overlord of their lands. Guy Beauchamp, with other English barons in a rare act of defiance against the church authority, wrote a powerful rebuttal to the Supreme Pontiff, basically telling him to keep busy with the salvation of souls and not meddle in English affairs. But in the end, the letter was never sent. Longshanks, not really needing or caring for the Pope's permission for anything, he did not alter his course. In the last invasion, he had brought Scotland to its knees. And this time, he had a blade to her neck and was in complete control of the situation. As the occupation continued, baron after baron capitulated and did homage to Edward Longshanks. Even after a time, John Comyn III, son of John Comyn, who had previously been guardian of Scotland. And after Comyn gave up resisting, Robert the Bruce also relented. Comyn and Bruce were significant because if anybody was going to claim kingship of Scotland, it would come from one of those two houses. And with them now under his thumb, his domination was nearly complete. One of the last holdouts was Stirling Castle, the one that was surrendered by the butler a few years earlier. As its defenders held firm this time, King Edward used their hopeless resistance to test a new technological terror that he had constructed, a trebuchet dubbed Warwolf, which is believed to be the largest trebuchet ever built. It took three months for Edward's carpenters to complete the weapon, and during construction, the defenders of Stirling sent a message to Longshanks offering their surrender, probably because they saw this thing being built. But he sent them a reply saying, quote, You do not deserve any grace, but must surrender to my will. End quote. And with that, the war wolf began hurling 300 pound boulders at Stirling Castle and easily brought down her walls. The weapon was a success, and now the very will of the King of England could raise castles to their foundations. A year after Stirling, William Wallace was finally captured, and he was given a brief trial and found guilty of treason. 
And in response to those charges, Wallace replied, quote, I could not be a traitor to Edward, for I was never his subject, end quote. Like the Welsh prince before Wallace, King Edward had him stripped naked and dragged by a horse through the streets. He was strangled, but not to death. His genitals were cut off, and his intestines were ripped out and set on fire for him to see. Finally, he was decapitated, and the remainder of his body was cut into four sections. Wallace's head was preserved in tar and placed atop London Bridge, while his body parts were sent all over Scotland to remind the people of their insolence. For his part in the war against the Scots, Guy of Warwick was given John Balliol's land holdings in the subdued kingdom. It was a massive source of income for him. And Scotland was finally done for, and France was appeased with Edward's marriage situation, and Guy Beauchamp, the 10th Earl of Warwick, like his father, had proven his loyalty to the king and was well rewarded. The king's son, however, seemed to be a falling star. Young Prince Edward was described as handsome and athletic, and as he grew, it became clear that he had a genuine love of the common man. But his emotions often led to poor decision-making. He developed a bad habit of alienating people he needed most, and he seemed to have a remarkable ability to make a bad situation worse. Longshanks actually banished his son for a time from his court, and he had apparently been reprimanded by a bishop for his excessive spending, and the prince's father took the bishop's side in the matter. The two were eventually reconciled, but there was clearly a huge personality difference emerging between the king and the heir apparent. The king also had issues with the developing friendship of the princes. A man named Piers Gaveston. Gaveston had returned with Longshanks from France to serve in his court, and he and the prince immediately grew close. So close, in fact, that many historians suggest there may have been a romantic relationship between the two. Stephen Spinks, author of Edward II, The Man, A Doomed Inheritance, believes the circumstantial evidence paints a clear picture. Quote, While no evidence explicitly states that they were lovers, the actions and policies of the king over the next few years gives a clear indication as to the motivations. End quote. So no one really knows what the true nature of Prince Edward and Gaveston's relationship was, but it can at least be said that it was unorthodox. Nonetheless, King Edward had growing concerns over his son's ability to rule. But this budding royal soap opera was dramatically interrupted by another explosion of events in Scotland. Robert the Bruce had done something that would alter the course of Scottish and English history forever. Though the Bruce had officially pledged loyalty to Longshanks, behind the scenes he had been biding his time and consolidating his loyalty from various Scottish nobles. There were secret pacts and oaths, something to the effect like, someday the Bruce is going to call on them. One of these nobles, John Comyn, richest and most powerful man in Scotland, whose father by the same name was Guardian of Scotland, had heard of Robert's strange agreements of brotherhood with these other nobles, and he threatened to bring it all to the attention of their new sovereign, King Edward. On February 6, 1306, Bruce and Comyn met privately at a church to discuss their differences. And there, before the altar of God, Robert proposed that John support Robert being crowned King of Scotland, and in exchange he would give Comyn all of his land holdings, which were substantial. When John Comyn refused, the Bruce stabbed him with a dagger in his belly. And as he walked out of the church with literally blood-stained hands, his entourage went in and finished off what life remained in John Comyn, ensuring that the deed was complete. Robert then hurried off to Glasgow. He confessed his murder to the bishop, who absolved him of his sins, and then threw the full weight of the Scottish Catholic Church behind him in support. The Pope, on the other hand, excommunicated the Bruce for his murderous deeds. Regardless of what the Pope thought, the Scottish nobles flocked to support him, and just a few weeks later, on March 27th, Robert the Bruce was crowned King Robert I of Scotland. King Edward, now approaching 70 years old, mustered an army to kill the King of Scotland. And his son, Prince Edward, now 22, was given command of an army of his own, and he would march with his father against the Scots as well. Initially, the Scots suffered major defeats at the hands of the English yet again, and Edward managed to capture almost all of the Bruce's family, his brothers, his wife, his daughter... The wife and daughter were thrown into prison, and some of his brothers were drawn and quartered. And the new king of Scotland was now an outlaw king on the run. But during this campaign, a new drama broke out in King Edward's house. Piers Gaveston deserted the army with a group of knights to go to France. The King Edward, fed up with Gaveston's bizarre hold on his son, and now desertion, banished him from England. Around this same time, the prince had petitioned his father to grant Piers the vacant earldom of Cornwall, a prestigious and profitable appointment. 
And in the wake of the recent events, it said that the king was so enraged by his son that he grabbed him by his head and ripped out handfuls of the prince's hair. Chronicler Walter Giesborough quotes Longshank's tirade, quote, You base-born whore, son. Do you want to give away lands now, you who never gained any? As the Lord lives, if it were not for fear of breaking up the kingdom, you should never enjoy your inheritance. End quote. But undeterred by his father's wrath, Prince Edward apparently gave his friend lavish gifts of clothes and horses and treasures upon his departure anyway. And Robert the Bruce, who had been in hiding for a time, he suddenly appeared again, and this time with a surprisingly formidable army. The rank brutality of Longshank's retribution had swelled the Scottish numbers, and out of a growing sense of national unity, a change of fortune was afoot. Before King Edward could effectively respond to the Bruce's renewed attacks, he became bedridden with dysentery. And now, on his deathbed, the aged king gathered his most loyal barons around him. Hugh de Lacey, Earl of Lincoln, Aymer de Valence, Earl of Pembroke, Robert Clifton, Baron of Appleby, and Guy Beauchamp, Earl of Warwick. And in this intimate moment with life fading, King Edward Longshanks gave his last order to his loyal barons. He told them to look after his son, the prince, and do not let Piers Gaveston return to England. The Titan breathed his last breath on July 7, 1307. He would go down in history as the Hammer of the Scots. The English barons embroiled in this guerrilla war against the surprising strength of Robert the Bruce now look to his son, Edward II, to lead them where he may. But Edward II apparently had little interest in continuing his father's wars and abandoned the campaign a month after his death. Upon returning to England as the heir apparent to the throne, the prince's first two actions were omens of his rule. First, he had a certain bishop arrested, the one who had once complained of his spending habits. And second, he recalled Piers Gaveston, his beloved friend, from exile. When Gaveston returned, he was made Earl of Cornwall, as the prince had long wanted for his friend, and he was arranged to marry into a very wealthy family. Before his coronation as king, young Edward had to travel to France to fulfill his betrothal to the daughter of the king of France, Isabella, who was now 12 years old. And in his absence, and in a move that infuriated the nobility, he named his friend, Piers Gaveston, as regent in charge of the realm. To you and me, this may seem like a small matter, but it was a huge slight to the nobility, as it was customary for the king's regent to be a close family member. These men were not excited about owing fealty, even if temporary, to an obscure man, a deserter no less, and one recently recalled from exile. Edward and Isabella's wedding was held in France before they came back to England, and upon landing on the shores of England, Edward was seen to run into the arms of Piers, showering with kisses and embraces, and one can only imagine what young Isabella thought of all this. At Edward's coronation, on February 25, 1308, Guy of Warwick assisted at the event by carrying the ceremonial swords, and what should have been an event marked by national unity was instead marred with discontent. Edward's unorthodox behavior was exasperating his already raised tensions with the English nobility, and was even sending shockwaves across the channel into France. It's said that at the coronation, Edward, now king, spent the entire feast in the company of Gaveston, ignoring many powerful nobles who desired to bend the ear of the new king, but most importantly, he ignored his new bride. Soon rumors were afoot. No one trusted Edward while Gaveston was, quote, lurking in the bedchamber, end quote. Gaveston himself was accused of stealing money from the royal treasury. Whether that's true or not, no one really knows. The unorthodox friendship with Piers, however, had turned into an all-out domestic crisis bordering on an international incident, and it needed to be resolved if the government was going to operate properly. At Edward's first parliament meeting, the barons were in an uproar. They demanded Edward send Piers back into exile, a demand that was supported by his young wife and her father, Philip, the king of France, who apparently was rather displeased when he heard of his daughter's treatment at the coronation ceremony. At parliament, the earls formally declared that they had sworn allegiance to the crown, not the man, and therefore their loyalty to Edward had limits. And on the surface, this seems like a small distinction, but it's actually the first time that the King of England is regarded as an office as opposed to a person. It's a revolutionary concept for this time. Under the massive pressure, Edward capitulated. He stripped Pierre's of the earldom of Cornwall and banished his friend into exile. But at the last minute, he had a change of heart, and instead of exile, 
the king appointed peers to Ireland to take the position of lieutenant. The barons, the queen, the king of France, they had at least gotten peers out of England. And as an added measure of security, the Archbishop of Canterbury threatened Gaveston with excommunication if he returned. The current lieutenant of Ireland, Richard de Burgh, had to relinquish his position so that Gaveston could take it. And it was a position that this poor guy was appointed to just one day prior. While Piers was in exile and over the course of the next year, King Edward II was singularly focused on negotiating Gaveston's return. He placated and wooed many barons who opposed Piers and won them over with various concessions and gifts. He also convinced the Pope to nullify the threat of excommunication by the Archbishop. And in the middle of 1309, Gaveston was back in England. But Piers, instead of adopting an attitude of reconciliation, took a different approach. From the position of safety as a friend and counselor to the King of England, he began referring to his critics by nicknames. Henry de Lacy, the Earl of Lincoln, he called Burst Belly, I guess due to his weight. Amer de Valence was named Joseph the Jew. I have no idea why, but that was a nickname he gave him. And Guy Beauchamp, the Earl of Warwick, he called him the Black Dog of Arden, Arden being a forest in Warwickshire. This man who these barons swore to a dying king that they would never let return into England was now publicly taunting them. When Guy of Warwick heard of the new name given to him by Gavison, he said, quote, If he call me a dog, be sure that I will bite him so soon as I shall perceive my opportunity. End quote. Soon, Piers was emboldened and flaunting his pull with the king by gaining royal appointments for his close friends and servants. Disgusted with this preference for Piers' agenda, the nobility refused to attend Parliament if Gaveston was present. Aside from the Piers' problem, Edward II had other major issues to contend with. He was still taxing his subjects and his barons for a war with the Scottish that he essentially abandoned. And he was also heavily in debt to Italian bankers, and he had no way to repay them since the nobility had simply stopped sending tax revenue to the unpopular king. And to exacerbate all those problems, Robert the Bruce had seized on the English political gridlock and military dawdling to regain the lost Scottish territory and raid the English border. Those who lived on the border had found it easier to pay off the Bruce to deter his attacks rather than depend on their own king for protection. And the nobility was just simply out of patience, and they forced an agreement on the king that would put reformation of his royal household in the hands of a group of 21 earls and barons. The group would be called the Ordainers, Gaveston would have no say in their decision, and Edward, with virtually no political allies, had no choice in signing the documents. Guy of Warwick made damn sure that he was part of this group. While Edward handed off the reordering of his household to the nobility, he decided now would be a good time to reignite the war against the Scots. But he could only get three earls to join him, and one of those three was Piers Gaveston. Edward II's campaign in Scotland is one notable for profound nothingness. The Bruce refused to meet him in battle and succeeded in exhausting Edward's army on what basically amounted to a grand sightseeing tour. When Edward asked the Bruce to negotiate, Bruce said no thanks. And by February 1311, his army was out of money and food and was forced to return to England. On his return, Edward's army was broken, though not from battle, and the ordainers were waiting for him, with Guy Warwick and the Earl of Lancaster the most aggressive of the group. He was presented with the Earl's reforms, rolling back a great deal of his power, and clause after clause was read aloud in Parliament, each one checking his powers of war and taxation mostly. He could no longer gift land nor receive money personally. All the funds had to pass through a royal accountant, basically, and he was also required to honor the nobles' rights under the Magna Carta, which he had been ignoring. But most importantly for Edward, there was a specific clause regarding Piers Gaveston. He was to be stripped of his titles of nobility again, and again exiled, but this time from all the realms under the dominion of England. Edward impotently agreed to sign the reforms if the earls would drop the exile of Gaveston. They refused, and in the end, the king agreed to all of their demands. And on November 3rd, 1311, Piers Gaveston once again left the kingdom of England. While Edward II was watching his power slip away through parliamentary procedure, around the same time, just a few miles to the north, King Robert the Bruce was holding his first parliament session as King of Scotland. So much had changed since Longshanks. Less than two months later, around Christmas, perhaps for the birth of his child, Piers Gaveston was back with Edward in England. 
And on January 18, 1312, King Edward II publicly declared his friend's exile as unlawful, and he revoked the ordinances he had earlier agreed to. When this news spread, the archbishop immediately declared Gaveston's excommunication, and the nobility prepared for war against their king. The earls Pembroke, de Valence, Lancaster, Warwick, and others were in hot pursuit of Gaveston and the king, who eventually split up, with the king going to York to gather what army he could, and Gaveston holding himself up in Scarborough Castle. Pembroke reached Scarborough first and dug in for a siege, and Gaveston quickly surrendered on the condition that his safety be guaranteed. Pembroke agreed and swore an oath that peers would not be harmed. With Gaveston as his prisoner, Pembroke stopped at the rectory of Deddington. Gaveston was to remain there under guard while Pembroke went elsewhere on a personal errand. When word reached Guy Beauchamp of Gaveston's whereabouts, he saddled his horse and he headed for Deddington. And the Vita Edward E. Secundi recounts the scene, quote, Coming to the village early on Saturday, he, Warwick, entered the gate of the courtyard and surrounded the chamber. Then the earl called out in a loud voice, Arise, traitor, thou art taken. When Pyrrhus heard this, seeing that the earl was there with a superior force and that his own guard did not resist, he dressed himself and came down. In this fashion, Pyrrhus was taken and led forth not as an earl, but as a thief. And he, who used to ride on a palfrey, was now forced to go on foot. End quote. I can only imagine it must have been abject terror felt by Piers Gaveston when before him stood the black dog of Arden, Guy of Warwick. Guy dragged Piers out of Deddington and brought him back to his own massive castle in Warwick. And there, Warwick, Lancaster, and the other earls and barons declared the man a traitor at a mock trial. And they had him brought to a place on Lancaster's land called Black Low Hill. And there... He was run through with a sword and beheaded. His body was left lying on the ground just off the road. It said that four shoemakers came across the body and brought it back to Guy of Warwick, who refused to accept the corpse. And it seems eventually a group of Dominican friars took care of Gavison's body, but no proper burial could be given to him because Piers had died in a state of excommunication with the Catholic Church. Upon learning of his friend's death, King Edward was enraged at and no doubt devastated by the actions of Warwick, Lancaster, and the others, against whom he swore vengeance. The legality of Gavison's execution was certainly questionable, but it's probably fair to say that Guy Beauchamp remembering his oath to Longshanks felt quite comfortable in his soul, but who knows. In the wake of Gavison's death, many barons ended up shifting their support back to King Edward. They saw Warwick's actions as an outright crime. And the Earl of Pembroke, who swore an oath to protect Gaveston, considered his personal honor tarnished and directly blamed Warwick for it. In order to prevent an all-out civil war, the king unwillingly came to a truce with most of the barons. In exchange for pardoning their rebellion and participation in his friend's death, they would agree to support him in a renewed war against the Scots. But Warwick and Lancaster refused. To them, this king was their enemy and they were done supporting him. Edward II assembled the largest army ever to invade Scotland, almost 30,000 men, and personally marched them north. His challenge was met by Robert the Bruce, who marched at the head of 6,000 Scotsmen, though in all likelihood a pitched battle is the last thing that Bruce wanted. And the two armies met at Bannockburn, where they skirmished on the first day, and during one of these skirmishes, the Bruce himself faced off in hand-to-hand -hand combat with an English lord who ended up getting his head cleaved in two by the Bruce's battle axe. On the second day, both sides were preparing for a final confrontation, and as the English advanced on the smaller Scottish force, the Scots knelt down and began to pray the Paternoster. Surprised and misreading this display, Edward exclaimed, They pray for mercy, to which one of his subjects replied, For mercy, yes, but from God, not you. These men will conquer or die. As soon as the battle commenced, English barons and earls started dying, and Edward, it seemed, would have been content to fight until his death, but... The Earl of Pembroke seized his reins and dragged the king from the battle fray. Pembroke and another noble, Giles de Argentan, gathered a bodyguard for the king and fled the field. Once away from the battle, de Argentan said, quote, Sire, your protection was committed to me, but since you are safely on your way, I will bid you farewell, for never have I yet fled from a battle, nor will I now. End quote. And yet for all his bravery, Giles de Argentan died on the field that day at Bannockburn. At the sight of seeing their king flee, the English broke into a rout and scattered before the Bruce in all directions. They fled into the woods and across rivers and were pursued for 90 miles by the Scottish army until they reached the English border. 
It's estimated that half the English force were killed, with much of the nobility taken prisoner. And for the Scots, their losses were only in the few hundreds. After the battle, in exchange for the captured English nobles, Edward released the Bruce's wife and sister and daughter, who were imprisoned for eight years up to this point. What confidence remained in Edward's leadership had completely disintegrated. And Warwick and Lancaster now claimed massive political clout for not attending the disaster in Scotland. And they again forced the king to submit to their ordinances. And again, he did. Almost exactly one year after the Battle of Bannockburn, Guy Beauchamp of Warwick died in his castle at the age of 43. Rumors were afoot that he had been poisoned by the king, but nothing could be proven. He left behind a legacy of undying loyalty to one king and unwavering opposition to another. His library was one of the most extensive for its time, complete with the lives of the saints and Arthurian legends. He's remembered as being one of the wisest among his peers, and his counsel was valued above all others, although I suppose that depends on which side of the murder of Gaveston you fall on. And regardless if Edward had Warwick off or not, things did not improve for the king afterwards. Famine was destroying his crops, and the Black Death was arriving from the east, and Edward continued to engage in his usual practices of nepotism with his inner circle and arrogance toward the English nobility. Food supplies had fallen so low that English commoners had resorted to eating dogs and horses, and there were even rumors of some eating their own children. One bizarre protest against the king occurred when a woman riding a horse burst into his hall, rode right up to Edward in his court, handed him a note, and then rode out as quickly as she had come without uttering a word. Edward made the mistake of reading the note out loud, and in so doing ended up reading a list of complaints of the king's mistreatment of his knights. In 1321, things boiled over and civil war finally broke out, and it devolved Edward II's rule into an outright tyranny. Lancaster, companion of Warwick against the king, was eventually arrested and beheaded. Kangaroo courts were set up to try opponents who were not allowed to speak on their own defense, and it was reminiscent of Gaveston's own trial before Warwick and Lancaster. Enemies of Edward II were thrown into prison, and their lands were seized by the crown. Even the Earl of Pembroke was forced to provide his holdings as collateral for his own loyalty. But in the wake of civil war, Edward's seizures of lands and money had made him rich. Now flush with cash, he launched another invasion into Scotland, and only to be outsmarted by the Bruce again. And for his next trick, Edward got involved in a war with France, which quickly overwhelmed him, and he needed to negotiate his way out of it. He ended up sending his wife, Isabella, to lead the negotiations since she herself was the new French king's sister. But once in France, she refused to return and may have even become romantically involved with one of Edward's primary opponents who had fled to France. As a result, Queen Isabella became a symbol for the English to gather around in opposition to their king. And in 1326, Isabella, with her 14-year-old heir to the throne, along with French and English support, invaded England with the goal of deposing the tyrant king. Edward asked for his countrymen to rise up and repel the French invasion, but none answered the call. In fact, as the Queen marched through England, the nobility rallied to her support. Edward retreated to London, but the angry mobs killed his supporters and forced him to flee. And on November 13, 1326, King Edward II was finally captured. As a prisoner and now a broken man, he agreed to abdicate the throne in exchange for his 14-year-old son to take his place. The new king, Edward III, was coronated two weeks later, marking the first time an English king has ever been deposed. Edward II was dead by October of the same year. And yes, circumstances were suspicious, but as usual, nothing concretely can be said. Two years after Edward's abdication, the Treaty of Edinburgh Northampton was signed which restored the Scottish-English borders to where it was before the death of Alexander III. It recognized Scotland as an independent kingdom, and it recognized Robert the Bruce as king. 300 years after the death of Longshanks, the Bruce's direct descendant, King James VI of Scotland, would inherit the English throne and become king of both countries. Imagine what Longshanks would have thought of that. The site where Piers Gaveston was executed was eventually marked by a stone monument topped with a cross. And inscribed in the stone is a statement that effectively sums up the characters in the story we just heard. Quote, In the hollow of this rock was beheaded on the 17th day of July by barons as lawless as himself, Piers Gaveston, Earl of Cornwall, the minion of a hateful king, in life and death, a memorable instance of misrule.
I was tempted to call this episode Medieval Bullying because these guys toss around more nicknames than a third grader on a school playground. Besides the Black Dog of Arden, you have Tomb to Bard, Joseph the Jew, Longshanks, Hammer of the Scots, Burst Belly. There's more that I left out too. Queen Isabella, I think, was given a nickname She-Wolf or something like that. I'm not sure why. The book Edward II, The Man, A Doomed Inheritance by Stephen Spinks was a great resource for much of these events. And he's actually got a really cool medieval blog called 14thCenturyFiend.com. And he also has a new book specifically about Robert the Bruce, which I've added to my reading list. Spinks actually puts together some incredibly compelling evidence that Edward II survived his imprisonment and visited his son on occasion. But if you want to learn more about that, you'll have to check out his book. And if the 14th century interests you in general, I recommend A Distant Mirror by Barbara Tuckman. It's a big book, but it's jam-packed with awesome info, especially about the Hundred Years' War and the Black Death and all that fun stuff that happened after Edward abdicated. My sister Courtney, again, provided the amazing cover art for this episode. And if you're in need of any freelance design, you can check out her portfolio at cjdejulius.myportfolio.com. I'll make sure there's a link to that in the uh, show research notes. As always, you can go to the website, writteninbloodhistory.com, click on the uh, show link, and right at the top, you'll see a link to her portfolio and also a link to the show notes. And then there's also... A pretty close script that I follow that's always there if you can reference if you want. The music for this episode was sourced from purple-planet.com. It's a pretty cool resource for free and licensed music if you're in need of it. And as always, if you feel this podcast was worthy of a review or a rating or a share, please do so. I really appreciate it. From wherever you listen to podcasts, that stuff really helps me out with exposure. Uh, One other note, if you've been listening to um, all of my episodes, you may notice that this is the first episode where I incorporated the new branding, Written in Blood History versus Thicker Than Blood History. I did that for a couple of reasons, but mainly there's a, this is kind of turning into a biographical history podcast, and I just feel like Written in Blood is more specific to the actual stories that we're doing. And so I wanted to change that now instead of down the road, you know, when it would be harder, when there's more followers and whatnot. So that's the reason for the change. I also have some plans for some future episodes that I want to do that may turn into sort of mini series that would be a branch off of the the main monthly episodes that that I'm doing. And so I think Written in Blood History incorporates that better. But all the old links still work. Uh, The Thicker Than Blood URL still works. So all of that is still there. So no worries for any of your old links if you're saving them. And so now, from the bottom of my heart, thank you, thank you, thank you for listening to Written in Blood History. See you later.